Uh, can you see the video? Mm, no, I see a blank screen. Last time at the beginning. I'll start now. Hi, everyone. My name is Sharon Lin. Today, I would like to introduce our work, TransN, which learns the nodes embeddings on heterogeneous networks. This is a joint work conducted by Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Nanjing University, WeChat Group, Tencent, and Shenzhen Institute of Computing Science. I'm the third author of this paper. So today our talk consists of four parts. In the first part, I will introduce what is heterogeneous graph. Then I'll formally define the graph representation learning problem. Moreover, I will discuss the motivation of our method. In the second part, I will illustrate the details of our method, Transcend, which consists of two different modules, the single view algorithm and the cross view algorithms. And in the third section, I will show the experiment results, which demonstrated that our method is more effective than the competitors. And finally, I will conclude this talk in the final section. So let's start the first part, introduction. In this paper, we focus on the heterogeneous graph. A graph is heterogeneous when it contains more than one type of nodes or edges. Otherwise, the graph is homogeneous. For example, the co-author network illustrated here is a homogeneous graph since it only contains one type of vertex, which is author, and one type of edges which is the co-author relation. And on the other hand, the mm -hmm. academic we network illustrated that. here contains three types of vertex, which are authors, papers, and university, and also three different types of edges, which is illustrated in three different colors here in the picture. Therefore, the academic network is a heterogeneous graph. Specifically, we aim to address the graph representation learning problem as follows. The input of this problem is a graph G with the vertex set V and the set D. The output, the output is an embedding for each node V, where the embedding is a d-dimensional vector which represents the node's V. The node embeddings are widely used in many graph mining tasks, where two most popular tasks are the node classification and the link prediction. The node classification is to predict the class of each node. For example, in the co-author network, we can categorize authors according to their research field. And on the other hand, the link prediction task aims to predict the likelihood of unobserved edges. For example, we can predict whether author 1 and author 2 will be co-authors in the future. Specifically, the types of nodes and edges are crucial for understanding heterogeneous graphs. For example, without node types, the two graphs will become exactly the same, and the underlying information of the academic graph is totally lost. Therefore, on heterogeneous graphs, the graph embedding methods should preserve both the structure and the type information of the graph. There are generally two kinds of methods to learn the node embeddings on heterogeneous graph. We list them as here. The first kind of methods are based on the meta paths. This kind of methods requires users to specify a special meta path for each graph, which is critical to the performance of the methods. However, Finding a good meta path is difficult for users since the number of potential meta paths is usually exponential to the number of node types. And the the second I kind of methods are type. based on multi view learning. This method divides a hit. There's some problem with my machine, just one second. Okay, now we can see the machine. See the screen. You can see the screen now? Yeah, we can start from here. The genius graph into multiple subgraphs, where each subgraph is called as view. However, the existing methods divides the graph into multiple views according to the node type. 
which cannot handle some graphs. I'll give you an example here. So this is our example. The existing multi-view methods will divide the heterogeneous graph like this. However, the problem is that the author view has no structure information for learning. And to address this problem, we divided the original graph into multiple views according to the edge types instead of node types. But in our methods, however, this methods also bring some new challenges. The first challenge is that how do we learn the information inside each view? And secondly, how can we transfer information across multiple views? So to address these two problems, we propose a novel framework, Transend, to learn the node uh, yeah. embeddings on heterogeneous graphs. Slide is and generally, mm -hmm. our method oh, contains two oh, algorithms, single-view algorithms. Single algorithms and the cross-view algorithms. For each view, we use the single-view algorithms to learn the node embeddings inside each view. And for each pair of views, we use the cross-view algorithms to transfer information across views. And as a learning method, we have two loss functions, L-single and L-cross, for the single-view and cross-view algorithm, respectively. And the final objective of our algorithms is to minimize the total loss single plus L-cross. The key idea behind our single-view loss function is that for each node n in the graph, and for each context node c of the node n, we want to make the embedding of nodes n and c be close to each other. We use a softmax loss to address this issue. And however, the problem is how to select the context nodes. The common solution is to use random walks. And on each sample pass, we take each node n's Kate order neighbors as its context nodes. Specifically, we control the random walks in our single view algorithms by this formula. That is, given the k and k minus one nodes on the random walk, we need to obtain the probability of the next nodes, n k plus one, to choose the random walk. It is determined by two different functions, pi1 and pi2. Pi1 here means that we prefer the edges with higher weights, since higher weights usually mean stronger connections. And pi2 means that we prefer the edges whose weight is close to the weight of the previous edge on the random walk. We'll explain this in the next page. Note that compare with node 2 vector, we do not need to specify hyperparameters. So here is an example academic graph where R means researchers and F denotes research films. The edge weights are the number of papers published in each field for each researchers. Suppose that we have a random walk starting from node R3 walk to refer the next node to be R1 rather than R2, since both R3 and R1 are not very relevant to the film F2. That is, we prefer the edges whose weights are closer to the weights of the previous edge on the random walk. This is what I have mentioned. We prefer the edge whose weight is close to the weight of the previous edge on the random walk. So now we introduce the cross-view algorithms. We can see that a node could exist in different views. So for example, a paper could be both in the authorship view and in the citation view. Therefore, after single-view algorithms, we have learned different embeddings for one node in different views. And also in our cross-view algorithm, we aim to transfer information across views. Specifically, our translation models follows the state-of-the-art sequence-to-sequence model. And given a pair of views, we first sample a path from a view, and then we find the corresponding nodes on another view. Since each node is represented by an embedding vector, 
the sample path can be represented as a matrix, where each row of the matrix is corresponding to a node. Then we use a translator T, X to Y, to translate the embedding from view X to view Y. And then we use another translator T, Y to X, to translate the embedding back to view X. For the embedding translated to view Y, we want it to be similar with the original embeddings on view Y. If they are not similar, the loss L, X to Y will be large. And for the embedding translated back to view X, we want it to be similar with the original embeddings on view X. If they are not similar, the loss L, X to Y to X will be large. And finally, the final loss is the sum of the four losses we list here. Moreover, the translators in our methods is a stack of encoders where each encoder is a neural network containing a self-attention layer and a feed-forward layer. The time complexity of our single-view and cross-view algorithms are this, like this. We can see that the time course is linear to the number of views, C, in our single-view algorithms, and the number of pair of view Z prime in our cross view algorithms. We then discuss the experimental results of our work. We evaluate our methods where the largest data set has over 3 million edges in the graph. The graph app daily and app weekly are from an online mobile app list store where their notes represent mobile applications, users, and query words. We conducted three tasks to evaluate the effectiveness of our method. The first task is node classification, which classifies the nodes according to their embeddings. Therefore, if the embeddings are well-trained, similar nodes should be classified to the same category. And the second task is link prediction, which predicts the unobserved edges in the test sets. And the third task is the visualization, which provides a more explainable aspect to analyze our results. And here is the results of the no classification task. We can see that TransN outperforms all the competitors on the four graphs. And here is the AOC scores of the link prediction tasks. The results show that Transcend outperforms all the competitors on all experimental graphs, which demonstrates the effectiveness of Transcend. And we next come to the visualization part. For the graph app daily, we randomly select 10 applets for each of the nine categories, for example, catering, ride sharing, and news. And we visualize the embeddings of the selected 90 applets where the embeddings are learned by two competitors and our methods. Each point in this figure corresponds to the embedding of an applet, and the color represents the applet's category. According to the figure, for applets with different category, the embeddings learned by our methods are more separated from each other compared with those learned by the two competitors, which shows that our method is more effective in distinguish similar applets from dissimilar ones. And moreover, the embeddings learned by our methods reveal the relations between category of applets. For example, the embedding of the hotel booking applets in green color are closer to the catering ones in blue colors than to the games one in pink color, which indicates that the hotel booking applets are more similar with the catering than the game applets. So we next go to our conclusion part. In this paper, we propose a multi-view network embedding framework, Transcend. In Transcend, we propose a single view algorithm to learn the node embeddings inside each view. And we also propose a view algorithm to translate the node embeddings. The mental results shows that Transcend is more effective than the competitors in various network mining tasks. So that's the end of today's talk. Thank you very much for your attention. 
and I wish everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, since we're a little bit late, so now we move towards the second paper. That will be paper ID will be three, uh, 327, an adaptive master slave regularized model for unexpected revenue prediction enhanced with alternative data. Um, so authors are combination from Tsinghua and Rutgers University. Uh, so I don't know who will present, but let's start. Yeah, Jing Shu will present the paper. Yeah, please start. We cannot hear. I think Antonio, you want to play the video, that's fine. Devanda, just wait. Antonio. He was playing it. Hmm? Okay. Hello. Now I will introduce my paper, an adaptive master slave regularized model for unexpected revenue prediction enhanced with alternative data. My name is Jin Xu. I will introduce the background first, and then the method, metrics, data say the experiments, and finally conclusion. What is the revenue? The revenue is the company's total income at a quarter. The companies will announce their revenue to the public every quarter. The notation RIT represents that the company I at T quarter. Before the company announced their revenue, the professional analysis will try to estimate the company's revenue. Different analyses will give different estimation. Then the average of the different analysis estimation is called consensus. In general, in consensus is very close to the company's true revenue. So if the revenue is not the same with the consensus, the unexpected revenue of a company indicates something beyond analysis expectation. For example, if we find the analysis overestimate the company's revenue, it may indicate the company has some problems like management, so cannot achieve this expectation. Usually, this company's stock price will fall. Otherwise, we find that the analysis underestimate the company's revenue. It may indicate the company has succeeded in some area. Often, this company's stock price will rise because the unexpected revenue of a company often indicates something beyond analysis expectation. It is one of the most valuable revenue information for investment. So our goal is to predict the unexpected revenue. We need some valuable data to predict the unexpected revenue. One of them is the alternative data. The alternative data is gathered beyond the traditional financial and economic sources. They can be divided into three categories. Some alternative data is produced by individuals like social media posts. Then some alternative data is generated through businesses processes. Finally, some alternative data is generated by sensors like GPAs. Okay, after the introduction above, let's formulate this problem. We have some data from company I, denoted as XIT. XIT is a collection of three components. The first component is CT minus K2, CT minus 1, is the historical data. 
the second and the third component VET and AT um, is the data as this quarter. The CT of company I contains the revenue data R, analysis estimation data VE, and the alternative data A. The VET is analysis estimation features vector. This vector <coughs> contains the analysis consensus ET and highest and lowest estimation. So given XT, our objective is to try to find that function f can predict the unexpected revenue. Our framework is an adaptive master sleeve model. Given xi, we use a sleeve model to direct predict the unexpected revenue ur. Here we use the linear regression model for simplicity and interpretability. Different from traditional linear regression, which fixes the beta v, the beta v is the output of the master model. So to sum up, given xi, the master model generates the weight of the sleeve model. Then the sleeve model is used to predict the unexpected revenue. Let's go into the master model. A company's revenue also has relationship with other companies. For example, if two companies compete, one company's revenue rises, the other company's revenue may fall. So from this motivation, we build a graph for these companies. In this graph, the node represents the company, and the age represents these two companies has a relationship. In our case, when these two companies' historical revenue has a high Pearson correlation, we add an age between these two companies. In this figure, we calculate the Pearson correlation between AAPL with other companies. Then, we select the top five companies with largest correlation with AAPL. To extract the representation of the node, we use a graph neural network. Here, given the graph structure is, we use a GNN model to extract the expect representation of the company I. So to sum up, given XI, the GNN-based master model generates the weight beta V of the slave model. Then the slave model is used to predict the unexpected revenue UR. But from our experiments, we find that the beta V has too much flexibility and easily leads to overfitting problem. So we propose the two regularization technicals. <clears throat> the first one is a supervised linear regression generation. Due to that the beta V has too much flexibility, we can restrict the parameter space of beta V around the beta ARC. The beta ARC is a pre-trained linear regression model on all companies. The second regularization technical is model assemble. We combine the slave model with a simple linear regression beta C. We find that it can improve the impro performance of the model. Note that the linear model beta C is different from the beta ARC. The beta C is optimized with the whole master sleeve model, but the beta ARC is fixed. Here is the overview of the master sleeve model. Given XI, we feed it into a GNN model. Here we use the graph attention neural network. We get the node representation from the GNN model. Then we add the regularization technical, supervised linear regression, and model assemble, which I mentioned above, to generate the sleeve model beta v. So here is the loss function. The loss function contains three components. The first line, MGXI, is a master model's output. 
the, the ensemble with a linear model beta c, we calculate the error between unexpected revenue and our prediction. The second line is the regularization technical. Supervise the linear regulation generation. We restrict the parameter space of GNN output around the beta ARC. The, the third line is L2 regularization. We also propose two metrics to measure the model's performance. The first one is a direction signal, bounded accuracy, which is the sum average of BC. The BC is an indicator that our predicted UR heart should not far away from UR. The higher BA, the better performance. The second is a quantitative metric, surprise ratio. We use UR heart minus UR, get the absolute value, and then minus UR. The lower surprise ratio SR, the better performance. In this paper, we use two kinds of the alternative data. The first one is online transaction amount data, which is amount of online credit transaction collected from the Chinese Union Pay. The data set is from 2014 quarter 3 to 2018 quarter 2. The data set contains 71 companies. The second one is map query data, which is number of the people querying a particular place collected by Baidu maps. <coughs> the data set is from 2016 quarter 2 to 2018 quarter 2. The data set contains 62 companies. We we'll compare our model with variant baselines, including the Indian model, neural networks, ARIMA, charge boost, and symbol baselines with alternative data, quarter to quarter and year to year. These two baselines symbol use the ratio of the alternative data to directly predict the unexpected revenue. Here is the experiments on two data sets and the two proposed metric. The table one, AMS is our adaptive master slave model. Transaction amount and map query are two data set. BA is bounded accuracy. For map query data, the first column BA is the average score of all quarters. We also should test the result detail on every quarter. For transaction amount data, we have too many quarters for testing. We just calculate the average value and the p-value. For BA, the higher, the better. We can find that our AMS significant outperform baselines. The table 2 SR is the price ratio. The lower, the better. Our transaction amount data set, AMS outperform baselines. The map query data, our AMS also outperform most of the baselines. To demonstrate that our improvement is useful, we conduct an interesting experiment. Backtest on stock, stock market, we use the model to predict the unexpected revenue. And if the company's revenue is underestimated, we buy the stock of the company and sell it a month later. If the company's revenue is over and overestimated, we sell the stock of the company and buy it back a month later. The left figure is the backtest result on the transaction amount dataset, and the right one is the result on map query dataset. We can find that the red line MS model outperform other baselines. In conclusion, we are the first to study the unexpected revenue prediction problem with machine learning approach using alternative data. We propose a novel AMC model for its unexpected revenue prediction. Finally, we conduct the experiments on two alternative data set, online transaction model and map query data to demonstrate the effectiveness of our AMS model. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm. 
Any question from the audience? Let me see whether any question from the audience. No question from the audience. Audience, audiences are, are very kind to the speaker. Let's move towards the third speaker in this session. So third paper will be paper ID 360, exact and consistent interpretation of piecewise linear models hidden behind API, a closed form solution. Uh, the paper is from mostly Simon Fraser University and one of the author will present the paper. <laughs> Devanda, do you want to start? Devanda? Uh, Dravanda, do you want to start? Can you see now? No, I cannot see. I can only hear the audio. Hello, everyone. No screen. Okay, let me share the video. Sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. I'm Zichun Cong from Simon Fraser University. This work is collaborated with Lingyang Chu, Lan Jun Wang, Xia Hu, and Professor Jian Pei. In this work, we provide a closed form solution that computes exact and consistent interpretations for piecewise linear models hidden behind APIs. As we all know, internet giants are already offering machine learning as services. They take advantage of their rich computing power to train powerful machine learning models and provide customers with API access to those models. Customers are using those APIs to make risk-sensitive decisions. Take healthcare as an example, hospitals may apply machine learning models on the cloud to predict the dying risk of patients. However, since the models are protected as top commercial secrets, customers cannot access the internal information of the remote models, which makes it very hard for customers to get the reasons for the model's predictions. In summary, Interpreting machine learning models hidden behind APIs is important because they can reduce potential risks and build trust with users. In this work, we are focusing on interpreting the piecewise linear models hidden behind APIs. Briefly speaking, a piecewise linear model is a nonlinear classification model whose classification function is a piecewise linear function. A piecewise linear model partitions the input space into several disjoint locally linear regions, and it operates as a linear classifier in each region. Piecewise linear models are very popular and successful. It includes many powerful models, like neural networks that adopt piecewise linear activation functions, such as ReLU and MaxOut. So how do we do the interpretation task? There are two typical methods. The first one is to train an interpretable global surrogate model. For example, we can train a decision tree to mimic the behaviors of the target model. So, by analyzing the decision tree, we can understand the behaviors of the target model. Intuitively, this idea sounds good. However, since there is always a gap between the behaviors of the mimic model 
and the actual behaviors of the target model, the interpretations we get are not exact. The second method is the local interpretation method. It focuses on interpreting the classification result of one input instance by training an interpretable model in the local neighborhood of that instance. However, this type of method generally suffer from two problems. The first one is that it's very hard to find a proper neighborhood size. As shown in this example, if the neighborhood size is not properly selected, the target model still can have complicated behaviors in the neighborhood, which are very hard to be exactly approximated by a simple model. The second problem is that their interpretations are not consistent. Since the local surrogate models are trained from random samples, there are some cases that different random samples leading to dramatically different interpretations for very similar instances. In summary, existing works cannot provide reliable interpretations. Before going deeper, I would like to introduce the criteria of reliable interpretations. A reliable interpretation should be exact and consistent. Exact means interpretations should be mathematically equivalent to the true decision logic of target models. Only in this way can we trust the interpretations. Consistent means interpretations for similar instances should be similar because that can reduce confusions and contradictions. Based on the two criteria, we proposed an interpretation method that assigns an important weight to each feature which exactly reflect the decision boundaries of locally linear classifiers. And the proposed method can also provide the same interpretations for instances in the same locally linear region. Let's first define the concept of decision features. Recall that in a locally linear region, an input is classified by a linear classifier whose parameters are W and B. W is a D by C matrix, where D is the input dimension and C is the number of predicted classes. WC is the C's column of W, which is the vector of weights for features in predicting the input of as class C. The decision features between class C and C prime is defined as the difference between their corresponding columns in W. We denote it by DCC prime. The vector identifies the features that classify an input as class C and distinguish the input from class C prime. For general multi-class classification, we interpret the predictions in the way of one versus the rest. The decision features DC have two properties. First, it reflects the decision boundaries between class C and the other classes. A feature with a large absolute weight in DC is more important in classifying an input as class C. In addition, the size of the weights also indicate the directions of the influences. Second, because DC is purely computed from the weight matrix of the uh, locally linear classifiers, it is the same for all instances in the same locally linear region. This property enables us to provide consistent interpretations for instances from the same locally linear region. Decision features have nice properties but how can we exactly compute them? To compute DC, we start by computing DC C prime for each C prime. It is obvious that the, DC, the predictions on an input can be transformed into an equation that formed by DC C prime and BC C prime. That formulation gives us a hint that maybe we can get a closed form solution 
of DCC prime and BCC prime by using the prediction results. Here is a naive method. We can first randomly query D points around the test point, and then we can solve a linear equation system of D plus one equations, which is built by the sampled points and the test point. Since the points are uniformly sampled, the equation system will have a solution with probability one. Let's denote the solution by d height c, c prime and b height c c prime. If d height c c prime is always equal to the ground truth decision feature, then we are done. However, this will only happen when the sample points and the test point all have the same DCC prime and BCC prime. An example of such an ideal case is that all points are in the same locally linear region. However, without accessing the internal information of the remote model, we cannot guarantee that samples are in the same region. So how can we solve this problem? The basic idea to is to gradually shrink the neighborhood until all sampled points are in the same locally linear region. What we do is sampling d plus one points in a neighborhood of the test point, and then we build an over-determined linear equation system. We can prove that if the system has at least one solution, then the solution is unique, and it is exactly the correct decision features with probability one. The key idea of the proof is that if the solution of the system is not equal to the true decision feature, a sample point must be on a specific hyperplane. But since the points are uniformly sampled from a d-dimensional hypercube, the probability that we sample a point from that specific hyperplane is zero. If the equation system does not have a solution, which means the sample points cannot come from the same locally linear region, then we should shrink the neighborhood. We repeat the above steps until the system has a solution. As at that time, all sampled points satisfy the same locally linear classifier, and the solution of the system is exactly the true decision feature. In our first experiment, we visualize the decision features of a neuron, piecewise neural network and a logistic model tree. The first row of the figure shows the averaged images of the selected f minister classes. The second row shows the average decision features of a piecewise linear neural network. And the third row shows the average decision features of a logistic model tree. The right and blue colors indicate features that contribute positively and negatively to the target output. It is clear that the decision features highlight the image parts with strong semantical meanings, like the heel of boots and the shoulders of pullovers. It also shows that comparing to the logistic model tree, the neural network captures more details of the objects. In our second experiment, we quantitatively evaluate the effectiveness of interpretations. Since a good interpretation model should identify features that are relevant to the predictions, we expect modifications on those relevant features will lead to strong changes on the predictions. We compute interpretations by five different methods and iteratively flip the input features based on the interpretations. The figures show how much the prediction probability changes. As it shows, our proposed method outperforms the other methods most of the time because our method computes the decision features that are exactly used by the target models. In our third experiment, we evaluate the consistency of our method. The figures show the performance of consistency by evaluating the similarity between the decision features of the input instance 
and the descendant features of its nearest neighbor, we can see that the interpretations of OpenAPI is significantly more consistent than other methods. This is because all instances inside the same local linear region share exactly the same interpretation. In our fourth experiment, we showed that OpenAPI can exactly compute the decision features of target models. We measure the exactness of an interpretation by the L1 distance between the computed decision features and the ground truth decision features because the baseline method rely on predefined neighborhood sites. We evaluate them with respect to, to a wide range of neighborhood sizes. As shown in figure uh, A and B, OpenAPI identifies exact decision features of the two target models, which achieves significant better exactness performance than other methods. In summary, we develop a method to exactly interpret the predictions made by a piecewise linear model behind an API without accessing model parameters or training data. Our interpretations are consistent for instances within the same locally linear regions of the target model. We prove that the decision features identified by our method are exactly the decision features of the target model with probability one. Thank you very much for listening. Please feel free to ask questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, is there any question? Let me check Slack. No question. Okay, so uh, I, I have a question. I don't know whether anybody, um, as um, the authors are here. Yeah. I'm not sure. So, okay, thank you. So my question is, uh, uh, the data set you use is a, is a high dimensional or how many dimensions each uh, data points you have when you use particular data set? Uh, we are using the administered data set. Okay. So each email should be uh, 32 times 32. Okay. And uh, Okay, so because you try decision tree later and then you don't face any high dimensionality sparseness issue in your algorithm, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't uh, no, my question, uh, my question, Since uh, that if the data is high dimensional, so do you face any issue with your algorithms? Because you, when you have a high dimensional data points, data might be sparse in the original space. Uh, because uh, we actually, for an input, we randomly perturb the input. So we mm -hmm. generate the samples uh, mm -hmm. instead of directly use uh, true, uh, true instances. So there should not be sparse problem. Okay, create more artificial examples. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the second paper will be uh, the idea is 456, statistical estimation of diffusion network topologies. And uh, I invite the authors, one of the, uh, let's play the video first and then we can ask question. And the authors are from China. And one of the authors is from Hello. Wisconsin Medicine, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Yun Jiazhang from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, this is a joint work with Ke Qi Han, Yuan Tian, Ning Han, Professor Hao Huang from Wuhan University, and Professor Yun Jun Gao from Zhejiang University. Uh, we are working on diffusion network topology reconstruction from a statistical perspective, and this paper focuses on diffusion network topology estimation method without timestamps. So uh, let's get started. Firstly, let's see what is diffusion network. Diffusion network is a directed graph that represents the diffusion relations between nodes. The nodes here are usually people and users depending on the application scenario. Here are some examples what diffusion network can represent. For example, it can represent epidemic spread on network like COVID-19, 
in a social network or multiple platforms like Facebook, they all can be called diffusion network simply because uh, there are something diffusing following a network model. The very basic usage of diffusion network is to promote or prevent future diffusions on network. Uh, for epidemic, it can do prediction of cases because uh, current prediction model highly focus on mathematical curve fit rather than the underlying uh, spreading model. The second is that we can do a precise quarantine uh, if we are given the network structure. Since diffusion topology are so useful, we aim at recovering the diffusion network structure, the diffusion network topology as well, uh, given the uh, uh, historical diffusion records. Well, there are many existing approaches aiming to solve this issue. Uh, they're mostly based on the temporal information of the diffusion results. Using the temporal information, uh, their assumption is that the shorter infection time intervals uh, between knots indicate that uh, it's more likely the two knots are going to be connected. However, generally speaking, uh, obtaining this information can be really, really uh, misleading and uh, very expensive sometimes. Uh, we can see how temporal records in epidemic network are misleading. Uh, here's the status change of some guy getting infected. Uh, this, uh, this guy got infected and, uh, and was in incubation at time T star and has the symptom of time T1 and finally goes to hospital and gets recorded at time T2. We can obviously see that there is a huge gap between time T2, which is uh, our recorded time, and the true time T star. And this gap between T2 and T star vary from person to person because a uh, different person react differently uh, to a certain virus or germ. Uh, that's why we say that temporal information is misleading. So we propose a method to reconstruct a network based only on the final infection states of knots, which are more easily accessible in most cases. And from the results, we can see that those temporal information are really uh, not that necessary. Uh, before we see the formal problem statement, let's take a look at what is diffusion records. We start with some knots initially getting infected. Uh, we can see the knots over here. We can see uh, it. Uh, the knot B is initially getting infected, and B tries to infect the children with probability for only once, which means that B tries to infect the children, which is C and E, and successfully infected knot C, and knot C further tries to infect its children knot, which is D. And this process goes further and further, finally, uh, until there are no newly infected knots, we say that this diffusion, this whole diffusion process finally ends. And since we are observing many diffusion processes like this, uh, we have several assumptions on the records that we have. The first one is that all diffusion processes are independent to each other. And second is that all diffusion processes are following the same network topology, which means that we are uh, observing uh, the diffusion records on a static network, rather than a dynamic one. So uh, we observe eta diffusion records, but only with the final states, say which one is infected and which one is not during the whole diffusion process. In our problem setting, uh, we cannot observe the whole diffusion process, but we can only observe the final states of each process. So in this case, in process one, we have B, C, and D getting infected, which means that in this uh, infection matrix, we have uh, in the process S1, we have B, C, and D uh, being infected, which denoted by one, and then A, E, not in never infected, denoted by zero. So uh, we have those, you can, as you can see in this matrix on the, red, on the right, uh, each row indicates the process record ID, which is S1 through S beta, and uh, the columns are corresponding not states A through E. So uh, what we want is to infer the topology from the records containing only the states of knots. Inferring the network topology means that we are inferring the edges in the network, and uh, this is equivalent to inferring the pair knot sets or children knot sets for each knot. 
actually in our, our algorithm we are finding pair nonsense. So under this circumstance, we propose a method called tens, and uh, we have a scoring criterion uh, to measure the uh, likelihood of a not set, a pair not set fi to each not vi, and we also have a pruning a candidate a pruning strategy to to squeeze the search space. So you can see the overview on the left. So we are finding the pair not set for each not, so we are iterating on each not in the graph. We are iterating on each node in the graph, and then we use a pruning strategy, and we call this infection mutual information to prune out less likely candidate pair nodes to squeeze the search space. And then we keep adding nodes into the pair node set, which uh, maximize the scoring criterion until the uh, number of pair nodes reach an upper bound. So uh, through this, uh, Algorithm over here, we can have the pair knot sets for each knot vi, which finally construct a whole network topology. So let's take a look at the first step, squeezing the search space. Because there are too many possible pair knots combinations for the knot vi, so it is too computationally expensive if you are searching the whole uh, bunch of knots in the graph. We design a mutual information-based pruning strategy to prune out to screen out those insignificant candidate knots, which infections are really have really really low correlations. We modify the original mutual information into a version called infection mutual information. Infection mutual information can better uh, measure the positive correlation between knots, which means that we are focusing on the. Uh, condition that two knots has the same state. If they have the same state, we say that they are they has uh, they have a positive correlation. So uh, we utilize this matrix uh, to measure it and we use a uh, we set a threshold tor over here to split into uh, large values and smaller values and we keep those knots with larger infection mutual information in the search space and uh, this achieved a very good time complexity as well. Generally speaking, we are searching for the likely pair not set according to the data set. Uh, what we adopt here is the basic log likelihood method. Here, the L, uh, LVIFI denotes the likelihood of a pair not set FI to a not VI. Using this log likelihood, we can take a score on the pair not set to a not VI. However, but basically, according to the intuition, a complete graph is able to generate any diffusion data, which means that simply maximizing this likelihood can generate a very, very complex, a complete graph, actually. This intuition is also proved by our calculation of the uh, likelihood function, which means that it, it is monotonically increasing when we add knots into a knot set fi. So here we adopt a standard regularization term, which denoted like this. We have g, which is scoring criterion, equals to a likelihood minus the penalty term. So we, this is our choice of the penalty term with a very good property, and you can refer this to our paper. And finally, we have an upper bound. Using the penalty term as a likelihood computation, uh, which is G before, uh, we have the scoring criterion, but to make the whole scoring criterion reasonable, uh, we have a naive constraint on the scoring of any pair nodes should be greater than the empty set. Using the likelihood calculation over here, we can deduct an upper bound on the number of pair nodes this bound, we use it to set the upper limit of the pair knot sets. So uh, let's talk about the complexity of the algorithm. Uh, because the searching algorithm iterate on every knot vi, which means that uh, for the searching phase, we have the subgraph st structure scan. It is almost linear. And for the infection mutual information phase, because we have to uh, consider every pair of the knots, so it is quadratic. So in total, the time complexity is near quadratic. And uh, I'd like to share some insights or key ideas that we found from this project. Uh, the first one is that intuitively for diffusion records, 
uh, diffusion networks because of the assumption that nodes are uh, only dependent on pair nodes. We can just find the local optimal of each node rather than considering the whole global optimal as a whole. So finding the local optimal has several advantages, like uh, we can save a lot of computation. We can uh, dynamically update if, if needed. And the second intuition, the second insight is that uh, infection mutual information, which focuses only on the positive correlations, really, really help a lot in the uh, measuring the relations or measure roughly pruning out the uh, edges. And the third is that about a directed assumption, because we are finding a directed edge, although the mutual information used in the first step is symmetric, uh, which means that uh, we cannot uh, prune out those uh, directed edge from the very first step, but the likelihood over here, which is used in the scoring criterion G over here, this is asymmetric which means that this asymmetric assumption leverage the ability to find the uh, directed edges. So let's step into the experiment setting. For the network, we are using LFR, NetScience, and DUNF. LFR is the directed version, uh, but NetScience and DUNF are, are undirected edges. So we convert the undirected edges, edges into a pair of directed edges. So for the infection data, we are simulating beta times of diffusion process on each network and randomly select the initial infected nodes. For some baseline using temporal data, we are inputting the original timestamps. For those using non-temporal data, we convert the timestamp into a status record. So for, for performance, we're using F-score. And for the benchmark algorithm, we are using uh, convex optimization methods, some modularity-based method, and a non-temporal based method. So let's take a look at the first one. If we change the network size from 100 to 300, we can obviously see that uh, this relatively small graph show that our algorithm can indeed find the edges nicely with a relatively good uh, runtime. And in the second experiment settings, we can find that uh, each, if we increase the number of diffusion processes, which means that we are keep adding observations into the data set, and uh, because, uh, as we expected, because we are, if we are adding uh, data data into the data set, uh, we have a more comprehensive observation on the true distribution, so the result is going to be better. So uh, this is in line with the experimental result that we have over here. Uh, the F score is uh, always increasing for nearly all methods. We also evaluate how infection mutant information really help. And uh, we found out that the blue line over here, the blue line is the tens with the infection mutant information. And the red line over here is the uh, tens with the traditional mutual information. We can always, always see that the F score of uh, infection mutual information is always higher than the traditional mutual information. So, finally, the takeaway of this uh, presentation is that we propose a diffusion network topology with the infection mutual information and a scoring criterion uh, to reconstruct the network topology. And the second is that uh, we are claiming that timestamps are not really needed. And third is that our algorithm is robust to a wide range of uh, network settings, which, which is shown in our paper. So thank you so much, and I'm open for questions. Yeah, thank you. So and let me see, is there any question from the audience? Let me see in the Slack. Can you hear me? I don't see any question from the Slack. Okay. Uh, so your algorithm is scalable against a very large graph. Does it scale well when you have a very large graph? Let's say. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. No, you gave an example with the COVID-19. Yeah. So if uh, there are millions of people are infected, let's say, 
and if you represent each node as a human so in that case your algorithm can work well in those settings with a very large graph uh yes it is basically in our paper we showed that uh we did experiments on graphs like uh, have 1000 knots and in a real world scenario we can split the whole graph into several uh, small clicks for example we can do uh you know uh the reconstruction only on the graph in madison or you, the graph in Dallas, uh, you know, split the graph into small clicks and uh, that will be uh, really practical. And uh, in our algorithm, it is uh, linear growing because we are just uh, finding the local optimal for each uh, node. So uh, the, the, the algorithm is also gonna scale pretty well into large graphs. Okay, thank you. So we are almost at the end of the session, the last, paper will be 457 and uh, the title is multiple dense sub tensor estimation with high density guarantee and authors are from Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Norway thank you uh, hello everyone today i'm going to talk uh, about our work Estimation of multiple dense substance with high density guarantee. Um, my name is Quang Hui. I am one of uh, the author of this work, and we are a group from NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. We are using thousands, hundreds of thousands of applications every day in our daily life. The applications are generating and estimating huge amount of data, where the data exists in several different forms. Data can be categorized into the following types, such as the first form is unstructured data. Massive amount of data is in this form. Some kind of uh, this data are, for instance, document, video, audio, and image data. The second form of data is uh, semi-structured data. This group uh, includes this one, XML. We can uh, consider this form of uh, data as a sequence form of uh, structured data following. The last data form is structured data. The data in this group includes uh, graph and tensor. Most of data in zeolite is in unstructured form. However, it is normally pre-processed and transformed to structured data for the ability easy for processing and maintaining. In the scope of this study, we focus on working with uh, structured data with two main data types. They are graph and tensor. So what is a graph? Graph is a set of vertices and axis. Uh, we have a uh, giant information that is width at a uh, vertex or on an X. Uh, the second uh, structure data type is tensor. Data is uh, commonly and naturally represented in multi-dimensional array and it differ to tensor data. Where we have the first order, first way tensor, it is vector. The second uh, way, the two way tensor, it is matrix and we can have a, a higher order tensor. For example, we have three way tensor, it is cubic. Uh, now let's consider our example. We have a context on the right. It contains two events with uh, water. The first one is water festival and the second one is uh, water cannons. Our question in, in uh, this situation is, which action is an attack? How do we know? How do we detect it? How do we estimate it? Extensive study have been carried out and so that's efficient solution for the kind of uh, application can be done by analyzing the density of subsidence in the data and the problem can be formulated as follow. Uh, first data is converted and transformed into structured types uh, such as graph or tensor, then by on a given interacting measure of density, the density is in subtensor or subgraph it detected. The detected subtensor um, uh, mostly interacting events uh, in the data, for example, for us, uh, attacks events. Uh, here we have an example of a tensor data, three-way tensor with three mode attacker server and time. The value in Excel is the number of uh, connection requests that a user sent to a server at a time. The Z block in the figure is 
the densest subtensor and it is detected as a network attack. Then sub graph or then subtensor are well studied with a wide range of application. Some example of the zero application about this topic can be listed as follow. The first one is a power grid monitoring. We have grid of node generator and access a power lines with current value. How can we um, detect when an electrical component has been failed? We why we estimate a voltage and current of power lines. The second application in um, first during user behavior, uh, network attacks and monitoring. We have information of connection requests sent by Soxit to target uh, server by time and with other information such as protocol, package sign. We need to detect weak of them uh, network attacks so that we can prepare solution for uh, our defense against the attacks. The other application is social events detection, traffic jam detection. We have a map of the road with sensor data, of velocity of vehicle on the road, and at the crossing. We need to detect these uh, any abnormal events on the map, traffic jam, accident, social events. In terms of uh, academic research, uh, extensive study of finding then sub graph subtensor have been performed here as uh, some uh, the presentative example of uh, this search about then uh, detection in different application and domain. We have this in uh, communities and uh, sprambling farm, graph visualization, real time story in uh, identification, abnormality effort de detection, and so on. So, what is our problem? We formulate the problem as a general densis subgraph set tensor problem as follow. With tensor given a n gray tensor t and a density measure f, the problem is to find set of slice q in t that maximize its density. It is similar with graph data. The principal and backup that dense detection as that from the two work at two timeline. The first one is Goldberg algorithm in 1984, and the second one is GD algorithm in 2000. Detecting then subtensor is consuming, thus instead of detecting exact uh, laser density sub subtensor, approximation is commonly used. GID is one of the approximation methods, but it is faster algorithm compared with exact method. It is an uh, approximation algorithm with a half density guarantee. And it is suitable for polynomial problem, but faster and easier to implement than the exact uh, algorithms. In the then subtensor detection, several work extend the approaches on then subgraph detection to tensor by considering more dimension for cement's break problem. Nevertheless, an, uh, an important drawback of the methods is that they can only provide a loose theoretical guarantee for density detection and thus the desire and the efficiency are mostly beyond heuristic and empirical observations. Beyond our motivation with a several questions as follow. The lower bound of the density can be guaranteed higher. As any, any subtensor having a density greater than the lower bound, and can we estimate the subtensor? Now we are maintaining many subtensors, but we need to know among the subtensor which subtensor we should take, such as the density are greater than a lower bound. How many of them having density greater than the lower bound and how to take them? In this work, our contribution are as follow. First, we provide a novel theoretical foundation and proofs to show that it is possible to maintain multiple subtensor with a density guarantee. We guarantee a new uh, higher density bar for the dense subtensor. We prove that as there exists uh, at least several subtensors which have a density greater than a lower bound. And we propose a new method that is constant term independent with number of estimated subtensors with guarantee on the density of all subtensors. 
In this table is a brief comparison of our parameters with uh, the existing uh, state of the art algorithm in subdivision detection. Our parameters is in the last row of this table and uh, in the uh, bro form. In the comparison with other methods, our method is capable of uh, detecting multiple dense subtensor with guarantee on the density of all estimated subtensor. Density guarantee in our method is higher than the existing method, and we also provide number of guarantee subtensor. Uh, Besides providing theoretical foundation theorems in order to evaluate is the performance of our proper method and so is efficiency in practical application. We perform extensive experiments on tangible data sets. The characteristics of our data set are given in uh, this table. In our experiments for widely used density measure, I use the azithromic, the metric, entry surplus, and uh, subspecies need. We perform extensive experiment to evaluate the performance of, of our proper methods uh, on the following aspect, quality of density, diversity and overlap uh, analysis, network attack detection, and we evaluate the impact of the number of um, estimated subtensor. Here are some of the results of our experiment. For more detail of our experiments, please check our paper. In this figure, uh, the result on Enforce and DASPA data sets where we record the average and the lower bound density of the first 10 estimated dense subtensor. As shown in this uh, figure, we can see that our proposed method is up to 500% uh, higher on Enforce and more than 800% higher on DASPA data set with the average metric. With the lower bound metric, our proposed method is more than 300 times and two million times higher on efforts than the compare method with azithromic and entry surplus respectively. And the obtained diversity by our parameters are 36, 37, and 20 on NQ, CoWiki, and efforts uh, dataset. The overlap uh, between the subtensor are acceptable and considerable in many contexts, for example, abnormally and fraud uh, detection, because a group of uh, fraudulent user might share some common smaller group or some at first. Uh, and other reasons is that fraudulent behavior of user may happen in the, uh, some uh, specific periods of time. The second evaluation is network attack detection. We observe that all connection in the top three substance file by our method uh, attack connection with no uh, phone positive. This is because uh, our method guarantees the density of all multiple substance it file. With the compare methods, it has the same design in the top two substance. However, in the third substance, only 56,000 connections are attacked, while more than 151,000 and as a connection and normal. In other words, it produces a high Z of phone positives. Weak in terms, it means that our method are performed than the compare methods. In terms of uh, execution time to evaluate the performance of the algorithm with the cost of the time of the algorithm on uh, the word data set using for the measure of uh, the density to determine the top 10 uh, diversity uh, subtensor. Then we calculated the average runtime of the algorithm per estimated uh, subtensor. As only as this uh, desired, our method is up to 6.9 times faster. The obtained desired fits well with our hypothesis and complexity discussion. Our methods then learn in constant time, independent of the increasing of the number of subtensor, whereas the execution time of the compare method in Linearly with uh, respect to value of number of substance. The explanation for this is that our algorithm needs only a single maintaining process to get the dense substance, while in the other methods, they repeatedly call the search function k time to be able to get k instant. Uh, in conclusion, the contribution of our work are 
a new technique, both theoretical and practical, to improve the tax uh, dense substantial detection. Uh, we provide a guarantee for a higher and lower bound density of the estimated substantial. We develop a new theoretical foundation to guarantee a high density of multiple substantial. We develop a new algorithm less complex, more efficient than the existing methods. Uh, efficiency of uh, well found theoretical solution to prove the efficiency, efficiency of our methods. Extensive experiments show that the proper method outperform the cousin state of the art algorithm for dense substantial detection problem. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, any questions? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can see the picture of uh, the airport hotel or something. But anyway, <clears throat> so I have a question for the speaker. Yeah. Okay, I saw you use uh, inclusion detection data set and Enron data set. So how, how do you validate your result? Because this, uh, your goal is to find, uh, uh, find subgraph or something, right? Yeah, uh, our method to detect a subtensor, then subtensor, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, no, but how do you validate that you find the right uh, subtensor? Is it correct or wrong? You showed some performance number, if I see correctly. You showed some execution time, that's good. You have a very impressive result in terms of the speed. Yeah. However, uh, whether you find the right uh, subgraph or not, how do you justify it? Uh, because in in this uh, problem, we it is approximation methods. We do not detect the densest uh, subtensor, mm -hmm. and we detect a uh, dense subtensor, and we have four measure of uh, densities. Okay. Yeah, so in, in our work, we propose a um, theoretical foundation to detect, to be able to detect a multiple subtensor. And so we evaluate um, our methods using uh, for uh, widely used uh, density measure. And we compare with the state of the algorithms uh, based on the um, uh, quality of the density of the estimated uh, subtensor. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I'm going to stop the session at this point and uh, thank you all the speakers for giving a uh, very good yeah. uh, recorded yeah, presentation thank you. and handling yeah. all the questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so the session uh, we're going to end. So the, you know, I'm leaving the room. Thank you. Bye now. Bye guys. And thank you all the, uh, uh, the Dev Devanda and uh, Antonio for helping us to run the show smoothly. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you, you can stop recording now, and then uh, you can start recording at the next session.